So I'm uh, Sally at NAS and I look after our um, information and our support services. And I'm here today with Zoe, who's going to be talking all about self-care. And I've got the easy job. I'm just introducing her and asking you, uh, asking her any of your questions. So while she's talking, do make sure if you've got any questions for her, you type them in the, in the comments box, and then I will be sure to ask Zoe them as soon as she's finished. So uh, over to you, Zoe. Thank you very much. So I will make sure Hopefully that you are hidden and I'll take it away. Um, hopefully that has gone through. Um, so hi everyone, welcome to today's session. Um, the video will stay on the page afterwards. So if you can only catch some of it, don't worry. We'll also put it on our website afterwards as well. But today we thought for the start of December, it'll be a good time to go through some really simple self-care tips that you can do through the month, going through into the festive period and into the new year as well. Um, so I'm wearing my Christmas jumper, my Santa's favourite spoonie, uh, my new top. So not pyjamas, I reassure you. Um, so firstly, quite apt for the fact that we're doing this through Zoom. My first tip is to really think about the, the socialising that you're doing through things like Zoom and, and other online events. Certainly a lot of people have found through 2020 it's really helped to keep us all connected, but it's really easy to overcommit and to say yes to loads of different events and then find that you're um, getting really drained from it. So although things are online, they're less physical for you, it's still requiring energy and it's still potentially going to be draining. So really make sure that when you're scheduling events in, you try and pace them out so you're doing them regularly um, and you have breaks in between. You don't go from, from one meeting to another. Um, and also don't be afraid to say no or to postpone events if you're not feeling up to it. Um, it's really important just to only do as much as you feel you want to and you're able to as well. And also really importantly, because the sessions are online, you've got less op options to get up and move around regularly. And of course, for AS, we know that one of the worst things you can do is just be sitting still for too long. So do make sure that you're able to get up and move regularly and you're able to keep stretching either during the session. You can switch your video off if you're more comfortable that way and get up and move around or even encourage the people you're socialising with to all get up and have a stretch as well. And then moving on nicely into exercises, there's pretty much no video and no blog post I'll write um, where I'm not mentioning doing exercises for AS. It's one of the best things that we can do, even if we're um, controlling our symptoms really well and we're on medication, um, exercise really is one of the most important things. So do really try and make a conscious effort to keep up with your exercises through the coming weeks and make sure that you're doing things little and often can be really helpful to fit in, especially if you're really busy as well. And do have a look on our website, the My AS My Life section. We've got loads of, of exercise advice, um, loads of different videos you can join in with, including Pilates, yoga, um, and a recent HIIT session as well. And we've got all of our daily stretches on the website as well. So I'll make sure that I link to them in the video description afterwards. And a way that you can fit the exercises in through the day, I've mentioned this before in a, in a previous video, you can have little reminders around the house in places where when you see those reminders, you've got a minute or two to be able to do a few stretches and a few movements. So some really good places are next to the bathroom mirror. So when you're brushing your teeth, you can do a few stretches next to the kettle. So whenever you're waiting for the kettle to boil uh, and also even on the fridge door so that every time you go to the fridge for something, it just gives you a little memory jog just to remind you to do a few stretches and exercises. And lots of our branches have been moving to online sessions as well while we're not able to meet face to face. So do have a look on our website and see if your local branch is doing any online sessions or even join one further afield as well to stay connected, keep moving and have some physio led sessions as well. And then of course, getting out and about is really important. So um, obviously depending on your local restrictions um, and depending on the weather, but um, Sally did mention to me that actually she really enjoys getting really wrapped up and going out when it's quite cold and having a really bracing brisk walk um, because then when you come back in and you get warm again, it's even more um, sort of comforting to come back into that. So even if it's not the best weather as we've been having recently, just wrap up nice and warm and get out and get moving. 
Now, social media um, can be a really fantastic resource. It can be a really supportive network and you can meet lots of people who help um, help you both with your condition, but also just generally um, connecting with other people. I know personally, I've found social media fantastic in terms of meeting others with the same conditions that I have and having connections and also just sharing tips as well, like, like we're doing here. But it is really easy to, to fall into a situation where the accounts and the people that you're following may not actually um, sort of be as supportive for you or they may well affect your mood in different ways. So it's really important to be mindful when you are using social media. Just be aware of how it's making you feel. Um, if you come out of the social media and, and you're feeling more down, you're not feeling supported or uplifted, it's worth having a look at the accounts that you're following and the type of news that you're reading and just seeing if there's a way that you can unfollow some of those pages or even hide them so that you're still following, but you choose when you go and read them so that you're able just to control the effect that it has on you sort of emotionally and mentally as well. And um, and definitely have a, a holiday break from social media as well. So it could be over the Christmas period, you want to spend less time on social media or afterwards into the new year, just making sure that you schedule in some time out so that you're um, not spending too much time on it as well. For anyone who's looking to connect with people over the Christmas period, perhaps you're spending Christmas on your own um, or you're with in-laws and you'd like to connect with other people online, um, then the join in hashtag on Twitter is fantastic every year. It'll be the 10th year that the comedian Sarah Millican is doing this, um, this group hashtag. So if you search join in, you'll find loads of people all chatting and meeting each other and connecting and supporting each other. So particularly for Christmas Day, it's a really fantastic community and it's really great to see everyone be able to get together and, and chat and find support. Now, moving on more to through the weeks surrounding Christmas and where our schedules can get really jam packed and it can be quite difficult to manage your energy levels because of different um, activities you have to be doing and different pressures on you as well. I always talk about pacing yourself and pacing your activities and scheduling in rest periods to help manage your energy levels. Well, actually, it can be really helpful to find some activities that you enjoy that are restful activities. So, for example, reading, um, you know, watching a movie or watching TV, listening to music. Uh, if you enjoy writing, a lot of these activities are more restful, but they can also be really enjoyable. So have a look at your schedule for the week or the month ahead and make sure that you're planning in some rest periods where you can be doing these activities so that you're, you're resting, you're conserving your energy levels and pacing yourself, but also it lets you do something relaxing and enjoyable as well. It would be really great if you're watching live to share in the comments below what you find really relaxing and any restful activities that you do. Um, personally, for me, I love reading um, and doing like breathing and relaxation techniques as well, which we've shared on the web on our website before on my AS My Life too. So do share what works for you as well, please, and get chatting with each other. Now, um, my top does hint at this um, because I am saying I'm Santa's favorite spoonie. Um, but for anyone who is unaware with the spoon theory, uh, I thought it'd be a good idea to share this so that um, it can help you both in terms of managing your energy levels, but also over the Christmas period, period when we're spending time with loved ones and with friends and family, either in person or virtually, it can be a really helpful analogy to explain fatigue and the fact that you have to pace your energy levels. I think if you've not experienced fatigue or chronic fatigue yourself, it's very hard to understand and very hard to empathize. So the spoon theory is a great analogy to use. Essentially, uh, it's using uh, spoons to represent a bundle of energy. So for someone who experiences fatigue with a condition like AS, essentially you start the day with a bundle of spoons. So that is your, your given energy for that day. And each time you do an activity, you're then giving away a spoon because you're using up that, that energy. And what you have to do is make sure that you're planning your day ahead in your mind so that you're aware of the energy that you're using and you're not going to get towards the end of the day and be low or running out of spoons and then not able to do the things you want to do. You can always borrow spoons from the next day if you want to, but that would mean that then the next day when you wake up, you have less spoons to begin with. And gradually over time, if you do this repetitively, you'll find that you end up sort of getting into a situation where you don't have the energy and your fatigue is getting worse and you're potentially going to have a flare up as well. 
We do have this um, cycle in a graph in our guide to fatigue, uh, which is available to download on our website. And essentially it's looking at the more we can manage our energy levels, the more we manage our spoons and plan out our, our activities to maintain that, then that actually over time will help us build our stamina or help us maintain our energy levels and hopefully prevent that boom and bust cycle where you do too much activity on one day and then you spend the next day really fatigued um, or the next days even really fatigued um, and recovering. So if you've not seen it before, um, I'll pop a link in the video description for the spoon theory um, and you can have a read and share that with any loved ones as well. Because if you know that you're going to be spending time with people who uh, don't necessarily understand fatigue or pacing, it's a really great way to explain that to them. And similarly, um, looking after yourself and reducing overwhelm can be really helpful. So making sure that you're planning your activities in, as I said, so you're not over committing to things. Um, and writing lists and scheduling things can be really helpful because once you get it out of your head and onto paper, it's much easier to forget about it. And then when you're relaxing and having time out, you don't have those things running around your mind so much. So you can also then look at your to-do list and particularly coming up to Christmas. I know this is a very bizarre Christmas for many of us. It's not going to be the same as usual, but often we get a lot of pressure and we have loads of extra jobs to be doing. And actually our to-do list can look never ending. So now is a really great time at the beginning of the month to look at your to-do list and see if there are any activities that have been on there for a long period of time that you actually, if you've not done them by now, do they really need to be done? Can you just cross them off the to-do list? Can they be pushed on to the new year when you have a bit more time and, and a bit more energy as well? Uh, and also then you can prioritize the tasks that you do leave on there so that you're doing the more urgent and necessary ones first. And then that takes the pressure off later on further down the list too. And then do ask family and friends for support and um, both in terms of practical support, but also speaking to them as well, just to help reduce the overwhelm and take the pressure off yourself. And if you don't have friends and family that you feel comfortable speaking with, then do speak to a professional for counselling, for CBT um, and for mindfulness type activities as well, because that can be really helpful in just helping your mood and helping keep positive and, and reduce that overwhelm too. And then looking forward into the new year is something that we commonly do at this time, particularly over the gap between Christmas and New Year. And this year has been so difficult for so many people and the uncertainty has been very difficult. And I know that we've had some really positive news regarding vaccines recently, but obviously the particularly the first part of 2021 is still going to be looking uncertain for many of us. So looking forward can be quite difficult at the moment. One way that you can get through this and to help you look forward positively without feeling pressure is to create something called a joy jar. So you essentially you get a jar and you decorate it if you want to. And in the lid, you put a little gap so that you can put pieces of paper through. And each time you think of an activity or something you want to do that you're looking forward to, but you're not able to schedule in now for many different reasons, you can write that on a piece of paper and pop it in the joy jar. And you make a commitment that at some point in the future, you're going to do everything that is on that is in the jar, but you may not know now necessarily when that will be. But this means that every now and then you can go and open the joy jar and read through everything. And there may well be activities that you find that you put in a couple of months ago that now you're actually able to go and do. So it's a really nice way of having things to look forward to, but without that pressure um, to be doing them right now and also to help with that uncertainty of, of when we can do these things as well. Similarly, you can do the same thing, but creating a vision board and many people do this um, over the new year period as well. So getting lots of different pictures and um, cut, cutting things out of magazines and creating a big board where it helps create a vision for the year ahead. And it also gives you something to look at to motivate you and to keep you feeling happier and more positive on those darker days as well. And you can even, if you don't want to do anything creative like that or time consuming, then just having a list um, either written by hand or on your phone or even a Pinterest board so you can do the vision board but online. That's a really good way of just keeping an eye out of things that are coming up that you can look forward to, um, but with as little pressure as possible. And again, looking back and reflecting on the year we've just had is really common at this time of year. And I think for many people, 2020 is going to be one that we're going to look back with very mixed emotions. Um, and obviously, it's been an incredibly difficult time 
for many people. So it's really important to try to look back and reflect on the year, but try and find as many things that you can look back on positively as possible. Sometimes gathering with friends and family and doing this as a group can be really helpful. So you can all maybe pick one or two things that you're grateful for in the year. And then that can feed into the vision board and things that you're looking ahead at as well. So you can even have reminders of those happier times from the year just gone and put them on the board so that they're there for you to look at as well at any time that you're struggling. And of course, looking after your physical health is going to be just as important as your mental health too. So all my usual advice of making sure that you're eating well, that you're drinking plenty of water and not to be too much of a Scrooge, but making sure that you're monitoring your alcohol intake at this time of year as well. Um, particularly if we're doing lots of social things where we're online, we're not necessarily going to be driving um, and therefore not drinking. So alcohol obviously comes hand in hand with a lot of festivities but it can make you feel sleepy at the time, but then really dis disrupt your sleep. And obviously there are loads of, of health issues that come alongside it as well. So if you have a lot of fatigue or a lot of night pain and you're struggling with energy levels, then trying to limit the amount of alcohol you have really can make a big difference. And as I mentioned earlier, medication goes hand in hand with exercise and with movement and with looking after ourselves in general. So actually medication forms a really big part of self-care. And particularly when we've got lots of things going on at the moment, it can be really easy to forget to take your medication. If your AS is well controlled and you don't get many symptoms day to day, it's, it's really easy to forget to take your medication. So having reminders somewhere, a timer on your phone, writing on a calendar, um, putting your medication out somewhere where you'll see it when you need to take it. Obviously, unless they're biologics that need to be kept in a fridge, um, just having a post-it note to remind you to take them can be really helpful to make sure that you're keeping on track um, otherwise, you, you may find that your symptoms start returning if you have a delay in your medication. So do make sure you're, you're careful with that. And then finally, uh, looking at sleep as well. So we've spent, a, we had a couple of sessions, um, both the My AS My Life, but also our Physio and Focus event, all about sleep. So do check out the My AS My Life page on our website for more detailed information on this. But essentially, making sure that you're sleeping as well as you can is really helpful to look after yourself. So making sure that you limit uh, screen time in the evenings before bed and make sure that you're not doing any strenuous activity in late in the afternoon or evening. Uh, you're trying to get into that relaxation mode. So using things like a hot bath, have a warm drink uh, and just general relaxation techniques like meditation and, and breathing exercises as well. And then trying to do relaxing stretches and things just before bed. We've got the 6 p.m. stretch on our website as well, which is a really nice exercise and stretch that you can do where you're winding down for the evening and it's really relaxing as well and then ensuring that you try as much as possible to get up at the same time each morning and go to the bed at the same time each evening so that you get your sleep wake hormones and your general sleep wake cycle in sync as much as possible and that can be really helpful for people who are struggling with sleep at night, some people find that naps are helpful during the day, but sometimes this can actually be uh, really difficult and make the sleep at night much worse. So do make sure you're careful with naps and just limit them and, and see how it affects you personally. And then finally, I touched on speaking to people a little bit earlier on, but definitely make sure that you are reaching out and talking to people if you are needing any extra support, any extra help particularly with the shorter days and darker um, sort of evenings coming in a lot earlier and with us having a very different uh, Christmas this year to, to usual. So do reach out and speak to us on the helpline. I've popped our opening hours and our number in the video description. And also Mind Charity do have a helpline that you can call. And in, time, in times of emergency, then definitely speak to the Samaritans. Um, they've got a 24 hour uh, helpline, seven days a week. They're all trained to be there for you to listen to you and provide support as well um, it's a non-religious organization it's completely anonymous as well so if you are struggling then definitely reach out um, and get someone to, to listen and talk with you if you need them so they are my main self-care tips I have done a bit of a whistle stop tour and so hopefully Sally will be joining back with me to go through any questions and comments that have been coming in so thank you everyone for uh, listening and hopefully we'll be, have a bit of a conversation going on there. So I'll just bring Sally's video back as well.
Oh, I said, gosh, thank you, Joe. That was that was an absolutely packed session of information. There was so much in there. And I think it's probably worth highlighting again um, that you know people can watch the watch the video again. And also I think you've written a blog which is going to appear on our As One website if you prefer to read all that. Because there was, yeah, lots and lots of really information, interesting information in there. And we've had some comments on the spoon theory and um, Raj Mahapatra, who's actually uh, chair of NAS, um, agrees with you. He thinks spoon theory is a great way of managing not only your AS, but also your mental well-being. We've had a, a, a couple of other people just saying, do you want to just briefly run through the, sp the spoon theory again? Or you can, and I know you're going to put some links in as well, but I just think it's worth doing because it is a... A lot of people use it, but not not everyone knows about it. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, we'll post a link to it. The, the whole analogy originally is quite long as well, so I'll try and condense it. But essentially, the lady, uh, Christine, who thought of it was in a cafe with a friend and she was trying to explain the fatigue that she experiences and she was struggling. So she grabbed loads of spoons from the tables around them and handed them to her friend and said, there you go, you know, each spoon that you're holding in your hands represents a bundle of energy so when you when you have fatigue um, or when you have a chronic illness that causes fatigue you have a certain number of spoons a certain number um, of bundles of energy each day and you have to think each day how am I going to use this energy and then she got her friend to talk through each activity she did and then she'd take a spoon away so she'd say okay I get up and have a shower so she took a spoon and oh I you know I make breakfast that takes a spoon and her friend realized towards the end of the day she was like oh, I've only got a couple of spoons left I need to I need to make dinner I need to do the washing I need to enlisting all these things and and that's when the penny dropped that oh so when you have fatigue there's really only a certain amount of energy you have you need to really think about how you're spending that energy and really balance it out so that you you do what you want to do, but you're also not getting to the end of the day completely out of spoons, completely out of energy, and then starting the next day even more tired. So um, hopefully that explains it quite well. Yeah, and, and Melissa has sort of said she'd love you to do or, or find someone to do a live, uh, a Facebook Live on how spouses can help their partners who have AS. And actually, I think even someone doing that exercise with um, with children or um, or your spouse can really at least help them understand the fatigue side of it. And Absolutely. Melissa will definitely take that suggestion on board. Um, I think Zoe did have some plans for February to be talking about, yeah. fingers crossed, yes. Yeah. So <laughs> yes, we've thought of it, it's coming up. So um, other questions, I'm gonna say there's a big range of questions. So, you know, brace yourself to leap <laughs> about to do some different things. So uh, Sarah Jane has said that, um, she's she's suffering with a lot of buttock pain and she well she wonders if anyone else has less pain i think it is fairly common in um, axial spondyloarthritis especially that sort of alternating from from side to side and so do you do you have any tips that you could share with uh, with sarah jane about that Absolutely. So quite often buttock pain, um, it depends on where the actual pain is. So sometimes if it's on the side of the buttock, it's more the hip joint itself. If it's more towards the back and like the base of the spine, that tends to be the actual pelvis um, and the joints in the pelvis there. It's really common in AS. It's often one of the first signs um, that people um, present to their doctor with as well. So the first thing really is making sure that your AS is well controlled in general, because if you're getting general inflammation um, and it's then, you know, affecting the joints, then that will cause pain. So definitely make sure um, your AS is well controlled, speaking to your rheumatologist or your rheumatology physio about that. Um, there are lots of exercises you can do because if it's more that the muscles are weak in the area or you're getting stiffness in the joints around surrounding there, then exercises can be great at stretching things out, at strengthening the muscles and supporting the area as well. We did do a session all about um, low back and pelvis pain as well. So um, I'll, I'll, we can pop back in the comments later and link directly to that for you. Um, but yeah, we've got a few exercises there. Um, but yeah, if, if it's becoming a real problem, definitely speak to your rheumatology team about that. 
Thank you. And um, so from Nikki, her pain at the moment is more situated between her shoulder blades, so sort of much more up her back. And she's saying at the moment she's visiting an osteopath fortnightly to try and uh, massage the inflamed areas. So I just wondered if you had um, any further tips. I think we also possibly have a video on upper back pain as well, don't we? We do, yeah. We combine that with rib pain as well because commonly the pain can feel like it's in the spine there, but it's actually from where the ribs attach onto the side of the spine. So um, you want to look both at your, your back movements and lots of stretches and exercises for that, but also the ribs itself. So sometimes adding in some breathing exercises can be really helpful, particularly deep breathing, because that stretches the whole rib cage and, and affects that area sort of between the shoulder blades there as well. You can also use things like a tennis ball or a spiky massage ball to do massage yourself as well. So you, particularly for that area, it's quite difficult to get into the bit between the shoulder blade and the spine itself because it's quite a bony area. So if you get the ball and you lean onto it on the wall and then bring your arm across mm. like so, that brings the shoulder blade out. And then you've got more of a space there to really dig in and, and do some massage there. Um, again, we can link to, I've um, gone through those techniques in a video as well. So we'll pop that link in there too. Um, and of course, it's always worth mentioning with um, osteopathy and chiropractic care as well, just not to have the joint manipulations. Um, just yeah. we don't recommend those for people with AS. And in, in terms of massage, um, I, th I think Sarah Jane's added another comment that she did have um, a massage and she was in a lot of pain afterwards. So she's not sure whether to go back or not. What would your advice be there? That's really common. So you see people at both ends of the spectrum where you can have really gentle massage and really flare afterwards. And some people, the best thing for them is like a real deep tissue sports massage. And what I would say is if you've not had a massage for a long time, if you or if you are finding that it is setting things off and making things feel more painful, then try those massage techniques at home first so that you can do literally about 30 seconds to a minute in an area and then see how it feels for a day and then just keep repeating that gradually because sometimes just doing litten and often helps loosen the muscles off but without getting that real kickback of symptoms sometimes it's just because you're getting things circulating you're getting things loosening off that it's almost sort of a bit of a shock to the system and things can feel more sore afterwards so yeah try try doing a few little techniques yourself and building up to it Okay, brilliant. And then just moving to a different body part again. So um, we've got sort of, so shoulder pain as well, shoulder pain, particularly uh, so sort of under the arm and, and the arm hurting. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I have a, we've done a lot of Facebook lives, but I'm thinking we did one on shoulder pain as well, and which I think you could probably just talk about a little bit. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's hard to keep track at, at some points, isn't <laughs> no. it? Um, yeah, we did. We combined shoulders with neck pain as well because they're so interlinked. Um, yeah, so again, we'll, we can link to the neck and shoulder video. But if you're getting pain kind of coming underneath the arm as well, and that may well be linked into the shoulder blade itself. So there are lots of stretches and, and activities you can do with that. So if you want to drop me an email, I've got my email address in the video description. We can always have a chat on the phone about that. Um, but yeah, AS can cause um, shoulder pain for lots of different reasons. So it could be that the shoulder joint itself is stiff, or if you get inflammation in the muscles where they attach onto the bones as well, that can cause pain too. So really identifying what's causing it is probably the key to then knowing which steps to take to, to relieve it. And just moving away from body parts and into dogs. Mm. Um, so just uh, sort of wondering, um, you were sort of talking about getting out and you know trying to sort of get some exercise so we've I've, we've had a few people debating about dogs you know is is having a dog a good thing to get you up and moving what, what's your sort of views on that oh that's a tricky one I um, know it is <laughs> I mean, definitely the, the pros are obviously you have to get out, otherwise they're going to bug you so much. Um, so that would be really good. Some things to really consider are your mobility in general, um, in terms of obviously then sort of poo picking. If you're able to get down to do that, that's something to really bear in mind. Um, if you have other people nearby who can then, if you're in a flare up or you don't want to go out, 
they can then take them. Um, that can be really helpful because you're not going to be asking them every day to do that, but then you've got that back up if you do really need the help. So I would say look at sort of your support network. Um, mm. But I mean, personally, I, I love animals, so I would say get them, but <laughs> you've got to, yeah, <laughs> really think about it. I think um, Claire Jeffries shared one of her patients um, sort of new technique is the the dog poo test in terms of yeah. how well their AS is depends on how well they can get down there. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> and probably worth th thinking about breed as well, I'm guessing. You know, you don't want a, a dog that you have to take out for two hours every day. Maybe something that be willing to, you know, walk <laughs> at sort of the, the level you're happy with, I guess. Absolutely. And depending on, on the breed as well, if they're going to be pulling on the lead lots that can, you know, affect the back and the shoulder. And also if you um, don't have the best balance as well, a smaller dog would probably be better. Um, and definitely um, make sure you do lots of training with them as well so that you're not relying on the lead so much so you're able to let them off and trust that they'll come running back. Brilliant. And, and, then, and the final question, which I, I'm not sure is possibly you're able to answer, but you know, prove me wrong. And um, Melissa is saying her husband was recently diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis mm. alongside his AS, and it's really bothering his hands and fingers. So do you have tips or are we thinking, I know we're trying to get a dermatologist maybe to come on and have a discussion, mm. so. Yeah, certainly. If it's the psoriasis itself um, affecting the hands and fingers, then um, I definitely recommend um, is it Psoriasis UK, the charity. Mm. There is, yeah, they have some good, good information resources on there. Um, psoriasis can come alongside AS as well. So um, quite often I recommend um, people just looking at the general triggers for psoriasis. So obviously making sure the condition itself and the inflammation is controlled, um, but also reducing stress can be really helpful for people and looking at different ointments and things that can be available. I mean, one of the best things I've found personally, because I get it on my scalp as part of my AS, um, is just coconut oil. So like you'd use for cooking um, and just really moisturizing the area can be helpful. Um, and particularly for hands and feet as well, sometimes just the actual action of of moisturizing and and rubbing can be really mm. for the joints too um and yeah and just using hot and cold as well can be helpful just to soothe the area too brilliant well thank you very much and i think as as you said you've got you've got a blog going up everyone can watch the video again and um so we'll let everyone get on with their day and anything that we've missed We'll add, we'll add links and try and answer everyone's questions. But thank you so much. And I think our next session now is uh, we're having, we've got a bit of a break. So I think our next session is the 19th of December, which is a Saturday. And we have um, a NAS member, James Hillary, who some of you might remember from before. And he's he was on Great British Bake Off a few years ago, I think maybe 2018 or 2017 I think he was in and um, he's going to be doing amaretti biscuits so we're going to be putting up the recipes and you're all going to be able to bake along yes yeah do come join us in your Christmas jumpers as well <laughs> so and yeah and any other questions don't don't hesitate to contact us on the helpline and we'll, we'll do our best to answer anything that you, you've got all right so thank you very much everyone